to our Sunday school. I'm very glad to have you here this morning. It's a lovely Sunday morning, and I hope everybody's had a very nice weekend. How was your weekend so far? Everybody doing okay? Yeah? Restful or busy or a little bit of both? We had a great week here at the church last week. Uh, we had not only our missionary fellowship on Wednesday night, which was so nice. We were at Corey and Dawn's last month for missionary fellowship and started missionary fellowship after a long absence. And then last week we had a missionary fellowship at the Parsonage, which was so nice. It was good to have everybody in. And we're not going to have it for July and August, but we'll be back together for missionary fellowship in September. And then we also had a planning meeting Friday night for the Vacation Bible School, which is really a great opportunity for evangelism for families and moms and dads and children and youth. So we're really looking forward to near the end of August, the 21st to the 25th of August, every evening, Sunday evening, Monday evening, Tuesday evening, all that week, we're going to gather together. Everybody of every age will have lots of fun and Bible lessons and activities together. So we're really looking forward to that. And that will really help our Sunday school in the fall and all of our programs for the fall. So we're really, really thankful that we can do that. And then this week is shaping up to be an active week too because tomorrow is Allison Porter's 100th birthday. So there's a special celebration for her tomorrow. And, uh, and then on Friday, our dear friend Boyd Harris, who passed away earlier in the year, his funeral is on, uh, on Tuesday. So uh, that's Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock up at Meadows Funeral Home. So lots of activity. So we thank the Lord that we have the health and strength to do all these things and hope that you're doing well today. We're going to turn in our Bibles today to 1 Timothy. If you happen to have your Bible with you, 1 Timothy and the 6th chapter. We'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll read a few verses here. And we'll introduce our new subject for the summer quarter. Last week, we started off our summer quarter with an open session all together downstairs, every class together, and I taught everybody last week. We'll do that again the first Sunday of July and the first Sunday of August. We'll all be together for an open session and give our, our teachers a bit of a break. And for the rest of the summer, we have a lot of special teachers who are filling in. So we thank all those who are taking part and look forward to hearing good reports today. Blake is taking most of the classes today, so we thank him for doing that. All right, let's pray and we'll read here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for the Word of God Thank you that we can put everything else out of our minds now. We've had a lot of activity and a lot of family uh, needs and work-related items, but now we can focus solely upon you and your word, and I pray that you would speak to each heart as only you can through your Holy Spirit so that we might rise to live for you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's read here. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's read in verse number 6. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment or clothing, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, follow after righteousness Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. We'll just read that far. And this is an introduction to our brand new book for the summer. This book is called Current Culture. We ordered it about a month ago and distributed them. If you didn't receive one, I'm not sure if there's any extras, but we can maybe find you an extra one. The word culture, by the way, is 
the manner of life for any group of people. So if you go into any group in a church or a workplace or family, there is probably some similarities between all of the people in that group. They won't be all exactly the same, but they will probably have some similarities in the way that they believe, in their virtues and values, and in the things that they believe and the way that they behave. Uh, that's not true of, of every single person in the group, but for example, you might have heard of the Caribbean culture. And uh, certain things come to mind when you think about people from the Caribbean. Or the indigenous or First Nations people, they have a certain culture. Not every single person in that group believes or behaves exactly the same way, but there are some similarities that take place through all of the people in that group, and we call those similarities their culture. Uh, take, for example, in the Old Testament. You read a lot about the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, oftentimes they were being rebellious. They were rebelling against Moses, they were rebelling against the law, they were rebelling against God. So you read a lot of verses about Israel being rebellious. So we could say Israel had a culture of rebellion. Not everybody in Israel was rebellious. Uh, there was David and Daniel and Elijah. But overall, the, the theme of the nation at that time seemed to be one of rebellion. So we could call it a, a culture of rebellion. The twelve disciples in the New Testament, you hear a lot about their doubt. Thomas doubted and Peter doubted and others doubted. And so we could say that the disciples had a culture of doubt. They weren't always doubting. Not every one of them was a doubter. But there were certain things that seemed to distinguish the 12 disciples. And that's true of any group that you're in. It's true of the group that you're in right now. We're not all the same, but there are a lot of similarities about us. And probably when you think about this local church, there's a few thoughts that come to mind about the people here. Those thoughts that you have about our values or beliefs or behaviors or attitudes, it makes up what's called our culture. So what would you, for example, suggest are a few words that come to mind about this local church? When you think about this church, as opposed to other churches that you've been to, or, or people that come to mind when you think about this local church, what are some themes, either their values or their attitudes or behaviors or beliefs that come to mind that would sort of form our culture of this particular local church? Does anybody have any examples or ideas of words that come to mind? Pe people of faith? Yeah, I, I'm really glad that that's the first one that somebody mentioned because that should be the most important is our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it's not true of every single person who sits in the pew, but hopefully the, the general culture of this church is one of, of believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. What else comes to mind? Yes? The authority of the scripture? The authority of the scripture? Right. We don't put any man or woman as head of our church. We believe that Jesus Christ and the authority of the scripture is what we should have as our daily rule for practice and for belief. So those are really good things to have as our culture, much better than being greedy and nasty and selfish. Some places have that as their culture. You go in and you just sort of know that it's an, an unfriendly, unhappy place to be. Any other thoughts come to mind about this particular local church? Conservative, yeah, what were you going to say? Yeah, the beliefs are always the same. So faithfulness, conservative values and conservative beliefs, faith, and, um, and all of these things, um, along with friendliness, hopefully, and, uh, and, and generosity. Yeah, that is for sure. So some of these things make up the culture of this particular local church. So the book that we're looking at is called Current Culture. So what we're going to try to do over about eight weeks together, there are 13 lessons in this book. We don't have all 13 Sundays available this summer. But in seven or eight of these lessons, we're going to look at some of the current trends that a, a majority of people in the world or in the church are adhering to. 
negatively or positively. And the one that we're going to start with is actually negative. You can see it here in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. The very first chapter has to do with something called the prosperity theology. The whole title is Behind the Veil of the Prosperity Theology. Maybe you've heard of uh, health and wealth preaching or a health and wealth preacher or a name it and claim it church or a Christian who believes that as a Christian you should really have it all together. Uh, there shouldn't be any problem with you mentally, emotionally, physically, financially. Everything should really be a neat package moving forward if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't know if you've ever heard of health and wealth theology or name it and claim it theology, but I kind of felt like I should have worn a really fancy suit today in order to present this lesson to you or a lot of jewelry on my hands and maybe around my neck or I should have come in on my private jet this morning because there are in certain churches people that believe that the pastor and the elders or the deacons and the main families in the church and the people who really are the leaders of the church should broadcast and display a sense that when you're a Christian and a follower of Jesus, you get a lot of earthly goods as a result. That, that you get a lot of cars and planes and money and, and, uh, and big houses and fancy properties. That there are people who connect godliness with gain and financial gain. I don't know if you've ever run into them, but they, they think that the more spiritual you are, the more it should show in the way that you dress, in the vehicle that you drive, in the house that you live in, and in the, the physical health that you have. That you should be able to project to the world that following Jesus pays back tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Now, I don't know if that's how you believe. A lot of Christians have that as their culture or their framework of belief. And you know it because when things aren't going well, their immediate thought is, there must be something wrong with me spiritually. Because why would my back hurt so badly if I'm in a right relationship with Jesus? Or why would I feel so bad inside, emotionally or mentally, if I'm really believing the Bible and following the Word of God. Doesn't God reward His children with physical wealth and health? That's the mindset that a lot of Christians have. And yet it's not true. There are a lot of Christians who are very financially poor. And they follow Jesus Christ faithfully. They love Jesus Christ with all of their heart, but you wouldn't know it to go and look at their house, to go and sit in their living room, or to get a ride with them in their vehicle. You'd think, the Lord must not be in this person's life at all. If they had Jesus in their life, wouldn't they have a better house? Wouldn't they have a better car? Wouldn't they feel better? Why are they in the hospital all of the time if they're Christians? You see how this theology and belief has become part of the culture of many followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to talk about it today. It, it, it appears here in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. You can see it as an example. In verse number 9, it says, They that will be rich. And that word will means desire. Those who have the, the desire or the the ambition or the drive to be rich. And some people do. They, they think, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have so many bills that we had to worry about? Wouldn't it be nice if the house was paid off or the car was paid off or we could just go buy whatever washing machine we wanted or we didn't have to worry about inflation at the grocery store? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just put gas in the car and it wouldn't matter if it was $100 or $200, it, 
It doesn't matter because we have more than enough money to take care of all of our expenses and to take care of our children for generations. Uh, we might all think that that would be nice, but there are people who actually long to be rich. They would do anything on earth if they could have a lot of money. And I don't know what a lot of money is to you. It's different for everybody, I'm sure. You might have a lot of money and think that you don't have a lot of money because your perspective is that you need billions of dollars, maybe, to be rich. I, I don't know, but there are, in verse number 9, people who have this desire, longing, or craving for wealth and security and the comfort and lifestyle and luxuries that come with being wealthy or rich. And you can tell if you have it or not, that desire, that will, that culture for wealth in your life, if you're not content when things are going poorly in your life. You know, if, if you can't be happy with a, with a small little meal of hot dogs and craft dinner or whatever it might be that's cheap at the grocery store these days. My wife tells me there's not much that's cheap at the grocery store these days. But if, if you can't be content with the way things are in your life right now, if you're not wealthy, you know, your, your car is a little older or you have to walk to get someplace or you have to take public transportation all the time or you're way in debt and you can't be content until you get more wealth then you know that you fit in with this idea in verse number 9 of those that desire, crave, and long for the security and comfort and luxuries that come with being wealthy. Now that's one bad thing in verse 6, but let me show you something even worse. And this is up a little bit earlier than where we read. Look in verse number 3 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 3 says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He's proud, knowing nothing, but doubting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, and evil surmising, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. So he's talking about teachers here who are false teachers, and he has nothing good to say about them. They are proud. They are envious. They cause strife in the church. And look at one, one of their main messages is in verse 5. At the end of verse 5, it says that they suppose that gain is godliness. So he says that there are people who make a connection in the Bible between financial gain and physical health and being godly. And he lumps those teachers all together as teachers who are corrupt, who do not have wholesome words for us, and who cause division in the church. So they have this idea that health and financial wealth are a sign of God's approval or a measure of your spirituality. So it's as though they put two people in the church side by side, and they, they did this in James's church, you remember, in the first or second chapter. They said a rich man comes into the church, and he has gold rings on and fancy clothes, and then a poor person comes into the church. And they not only treated those people differently, they said to the poor person, go sit in the corner, and they had the, the rich person up on the platform, but more than just treating them differently, they actually saw God as treating each person differently, as though it matters to God how big your bank book is, as, as though God is impressed by the clothes that we wear, uh, as though God favors the rich. If that were true, then all the rich people would be going to heaven. But do you know that the Bible says that it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of the needle? So it's not like all the rich people have some favor for God that they just immediately go to heaven and all of the poor people somehow 
are out of the will of God. But in churches, sometimes poor people are treated that way, that there's something wrong with them spiritually. And not just poor people, but unhealthy people too. Everybody has this frame of mind, this culture, not everybody, but a majority of people seem to have this frame of mind that if you're walking with God, you're going to be healthy all the time. And if you're walking with God, you're going to have a lot more physical things than if you weren't walking with God. But that's not true. Do you know that some of the wealthiest, healthiest people hate God? They don't love God. They don't walk with God. They don't value the Word of God. And there are teachers, Paul said to Timothy, and you have to be very careful to be on the lookout for them, he said, <clears throat> they believe that if you're sick and poor, then there must be something wrong with your faith or your relationship with God. But if you're healthy and you're wealthy, then you're on the right track. And we call these preachers sometimes health and wealth preachers or name it and claim it preachers. But John Piper, he's not one of them. He wrote this one time. He said, if God's love for his children is measured by our health, wealth and comfort in this life, then God hated the Apostle Paul. Because Paul didn't have any of that stuff. He wasn't comfortable in his life. He didn't have a nice place to lay down and sleep each night. He didn't have a soft pillow to take with him everywhere that he went. He didn't have good transportation. Uh, Paul was a very poor and unhealthy person. Apparently he had an eye disease that caused him a great deal of trouble when he was trying to read or write. He often had somebody write his letters for him because he said, if I write them, you're going to see that they're very large characters that I have to write because I can't see a small little printing on the page. So it's terrible to have this desire for wealth, and it's even worse that there are preachers who claim that we should be healthy all the time and wealthy all the time. Now the reason that they think this is because they think that in the atonement of Christ, when Christ died for our sins, that he made a way for us all to be wealthy and healthy on this earth. They also think that you have a right to wealth and health as a Christian. They also believe that they're almost like little gods with their words, that you can name something and claim it, that, that you by your words can actually cause something good to happen, like God created the world with his words, and he rose Christ from the dead, raised him from the dead with his words. And so they think that if you want a certain vehicle or you you don't want to be sick, you just have the power in your words to, by faith, claim that. And I just, I just claim that I don't have a migraine headache anymore, or I just claim that I'm going to have that blue vehicle that I've always wanted, and, and by faith I'm just going to reach out and take it with my words. I, I am not God. I'm not even a little God. I'm a dust of the earth, that by the grace of God I'm still living this day. I... I don't have the power to just claim whatever I want and make money come to me somehow. Some people work very hard and believe the Lord very strongly and money never comes to them. Money is not something that God promises to come to you as a believer. Health and big homes and nice vehicles, that's not something that we can just expect or demand from the Lord. And perhaps one of the worst things that they do in this culture of, of wealth and health is they think that somehow you can plant a seed by giving money to them and God will reward you with more wealth. Uh, that's a terrible doctrine to think that we, we pass the plate on Sunday so that you somehow can benefit by getting more money on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. That's not giving out of the generosity of your heart or for the work of the Lord. That's giving so that you can get. And that's a terrible attitude to have. And yet there's many preachers who promise their people that if you give, then God will give back to you in the same measure that, 
that you give. Now, I have no doubt that God gives back to people, but if you give $100, he's not going to give $100 back to you, or, or $200 or $500 back to you. He will bless you in many ways, but how do we believe that God blesses people in, in the age in which we live? We believe it's spiritual, that God will bless you with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And you'll have many, many opportunities for health and wealth in glory in heaven. But I think it's terrible for a pastor to promise someone that if you put money in the offering plate and, and give money to a man of God or a woman of God, that you're going to get money back and much more money than you gave. And, and yet that's what they say. You can listen to them on the television or the internet. They encourage people to actually borrow money from their credit cards and, and, and send the borrowed money in because the preacher says that you will get money back to not only pay off your credit cards, but far more. And so they, they use it like this investment scheme almost. But the poor dear soul who's sending in the money off their credit cards, they may be blessed of the Lord in some ways, but not enough to pay off their credit card at the end of the month and certainly not more than what they borrowed, a health and wealth and prosperity preaching that's totally wrong. And sadly, I don't mean to point fingers, but a lot of good things came out of the United States of America. They gave us microwave ovens and traffic lights and email and the internet and personal telephones, but they also gave us health and wealth prosperity preachers. That's where they all come from, is the United States. That's where it started, and it is spread around the world and now there's people in every province and territory who have this culture of believing that you should be healthy and wealthy and wise on this earth. Here's what one preacher said. This was back in an article in 2009. Every Christmas, Christians tell stories about the poor baby Jesus born in the lowly manger because there was no room in the inn. But Reverend Thomas Anderson, senior pastor at the Living Water or the Living Word Bible Church in Arizona, preaches a different version of the Christmas story that says baby Jesus wasn't poor after all. He says Jesus couldn't have been poor because he received gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh at birth, and at his death the Roman soldiers who crucified him gambled for his expensive garments. Plus, he said, Mary and Joseph both basically took a Cadillac to get to Bethlehem because the finest transportation in their day was a donkey. Only wealthy people had uh, that kind of transportation. And then he said that Jesus even had somebody to keep his bag of money, Judas. And the last time he checked, poor people didn't have treasurers to take care of their money. So he presents that Jesus was rich. Now, I never heard anything so foolish in my whole life. You've got to twist a whole lot of verses to get the idea that Jesus lived a rich, wealthy life. Uh, Jesus was very humble and poor. And that's why every poor person on the planet can identify with him. And he with them. He has been where we've all been, without and hungry and, and thirsty and without a place to lay his head, the Bible said. So Jesus Christ was not rich, and yet they present him as being rich and his atonement providing for our riches and physical health, and yet none of it is true. And we have to be very, very cautious. Um, many people in the Bible were poor, and many were sick. And yes, sin can be a result of the, uh, uh, a sickness rather, can be a result of the sin in our life, but it's not true that every sick person is a sinner or, yes, they're all sinners, but they haven't personally sinned in a way that has caused their sickness. Sometimes sickness is for the glory of God and for our own humility and teaching. So here's, in conclusion, a great little quote. It says, What I count as real prosperity is growth in the knowledge of God and in a testimony and in the power to live the gospel and to inspire our families to do the same. That is the truest kind of of prosperity. Now, does anybody have a comment about prosperity preaching or prosperity health and wealth uh, teaching? Did you come across it somewhere or have a warning for us about it? Uh, who, yes? One of the worst things that we've ever said to us when Chester was first diagnosed with cerebral palsy, uh, 
Oh, no. Is that right? And, and that is a person who believes that our words are as powerful as the words of God. And, and yes, there are negative and positive words that can affect us and affect our lives and the, the, the attitudes of people around us. But we don't create reality or interfere with it by our words. I, if, if I'm ill... I'm not going to heal myself with my words like the Lord Jesus Christ is able to. And so that's a terrible thing for somebody to have said. And, uh, and I, I know that uh, many of you know all about uh, pain and suffering and, and hardship. And, uh, and we trust the Lord to, to take us through it and give us a, a beautiful life one day in, in heaven. So that's where we'll pause today for our lesson Next week, we're going to go on to lesson number two. Um, that's going to be a little bit about finances and, and the economy and even a little bit about socialism and communism. So there'll be some of that next week. And then the third week, what I'm going to have you do is to pick which lesson you want us to hear on week number three. So uh, get ready for lesson two next week and then maybe look forward because we don't have time to look at every lesson I'll let you pick out which lesson you'd like to hear on week number three. So I'll ask you about that next week. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have given us the word which anticipates everything that we'll uh, need for life and godliness. Uh, you warn us about teachers who would corrupt our minds. And I pray that nobody here would feel that if they're not doing well financially or or physically, that there's something wrong with their spirit. There may be, but you can be very poor and unhealthy and yet love Jesus with all your heart and be on your way to heaven. And you can be very rich and healthy and yet not know Jesus and not be on your way to heaven. So help us not to make health and wealth the measure of our spirituality. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.